then uh, conducting an electrical at the same time, uh, the conductivity of the resistivity of these materials can be as low as 1.5 10 to minus 4 mm centimeter, and they show high transmittance at visible and ARR range. Uh, here we have shown a graph of uh, transmittance as a function of wavelength for two different films like these, uh, with different thicknesses, one with 50 nanometer, the other one with 240 nanometer, and you can see that, for example, for a 50 nanometer film, it's pretty transparent. Pretty, it shows pretty good transparency in the visible and IR. So all these favorable properties, for example, uh, the good conductivity, the flexibility, the transparency, results in uh, people trying to uh, basically make many different devices uh, with these structures. Some of the applications so far followed are TV transistors, chemical thermal sensors, flexible microelectronics and they are used as only context of electronic and photovoltaic devices for example, getting nitride LEDs, organic LEDs, or solar cells uh, some examples I've uh, put here, for example, this one is when the people have tried to align the nanotubes and make like, very good transistors out of these by burning just the metal tubes uh, of course it's not that trivial, but I guess uh, people have done that uh, they have been also used as sensor because the nanotubes are already like have a very large surface to volume ratio so they are very suitable for some sensing applications. Uh, other examples are more sort of, sort of uh, basically one is uh, micro optical mechanical actuators in which nanotubes are responsive to light in a very act as an active layer. And we have some more recent ones are like some solar cell applications in which basically the nanotubes are in contact with the substrate that can be organic or inorganic. And then basically uh, you can get uh, the IV uh, characteristics of them and then analyze uh, the solar cell behavior. This actually is a very hot area right now. Many people are working on that, trying to improve uh, these structures. So um, basically, the first part of my talk uh, is going to be devoted to, OK, we have these structures. We have these things. We want to analyze them before we can use them for different applications. There are so many things because of this complex structure of the thing that we need to analyze. And uh, so I'm going to first show how we pattern and uh, basically fabricate devices, oops, fabricate devices with these films. And then uh, our study of the resistivity scaling with device dimensions and the effect of temperature and the noise scaling with these films. So how we fabricate devices is basically after we form these films, which is a, based on a vacuum filtration process, we basically uh, have a solution of these nanotubes that go through a filter and then you have a, 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 that the nanotubes are not passing the filter, they are depositing on the substrate. And then you have a film on the filter, then you need to move the film basically onto a substrate. And then it, this filter needs to be removed. After that, so you get just the film on a substrate. Then you put some resist material and you use a regular lithography step to just uh, basically pattern the resist. Then you use uh, O2 plus managing. Uh, in a may maybe RIE system to just edge the field and then you basically remove the resist to just get the CMT field pattern. Uh, an example is shown here. Here is an atomic force microscopy image of the basically top view of some lines that we pattern on uh, some not very thick fields. Um, you can see the height profile in, uh, in this here. You can see that the surface is pretty neat, although there are some residues anyway, but uh, it worked pretty well in terms of etching the material. Um, and then for, for, for basically a uh, real application that we can characterize, we have fabricated these 4.4 structures on the films. So this region is like the oxide, uh, silicon dioxide, and then on top of that we have this green uh, area that's patterned. This is like the film. And then uh, these yellow uh, squares are uh, metallic pads that are deposited on the film for ease of probing. Um, then basically we have device dimensions that we can control, like the length between these two probes that are important and the width of the uh, film, and also the thickness of the film, which is perpendicular, of course, to this direction, but we can deposit films with different thicknesses as well. Uh, so simply, if, you, if it is a very uniform material, what you guess is that you expect that the resistance should just scale like very simply with length, width, and thickness in this form. Um, However, as I will show, what we saw was quite different from this. So we first studied the effect of length. Other people have done that before us. It was just a double check on the structure. We noticed that if we don't go to very small lengths, like to about 10 micron length or so, the resistivity is almost constant 
for as we change the length of this structure. However, it's constant for a certain set of other parameters. So for example, if you have different thickness and different width, uh, you get different values of resistivity, but those values are independent of the length down to that width. Um, so then we went, okay, we said, so now the width and thickness seem to have some effect on the, the structure, so let, let's study them one by one. We went uh, first study the effect of thickness on the resistivity. We noticed that as we shrink the thickness of the device, so basically we deposit thinner and thinner films, we see an increase in the resistivity. And this increase is basically due to the percolation, percolative nature of these films. As you reduce the thickness, you have fewer and fewer nanotubes in contact with each, other, with each other. So you get a very thin network. At some point, there is no conductance anymore. So uh, basically, this, such a behavior can eventually mm, be modeled by a power load dependence close to a point where, is the, where there is no connection at all. And that point is called percolation threshold. And if you do such a, such a fitting, you get an equation simply like this where this TC is the critical thickness. Uh, it, it's reported to be around 3 nanometer. Of course, it depends on the like, bonding and some other things that might happen in the network. Um, there's also this exponent that's important for this thickness study that this exponent turned out to be 2.3. And we didn't really have like, too many thicknesses, so we just had the like, two data points. So it's not really a very accurate estimate that for this kind of study. Uh, then we went on and we studied something that didn't, other people didn't do and that was the effect of width. And what we noticed was that as we uh, basically reduced the width of the device uh, or width of the field, uh, first, okay, it's constant like down to a certain point below 20 micron or so it starts to increase and then it becomes really, really aggressive if you like push it down with even photography down to like a few hundred nanometers. And again, you see that sort of uh, strong dependence, which is again a sort of a power low relationship. Here, we tried it with two, for, with films with two different thicknesses. We got like sort of similar exponents, like 1.5, 1.4 for the uh, basic exponent in this equation. So a few things to explain. Uh, the, okay, so with thickness, it's pretty clear. As we reduce the thickness, you uh, basically reduce the density of the nanotubes in the network. What happens with the width is basically when you uh, decrease the width of the device, and uh, there are some paths that go around, like uh, they basically they just don't, don't go like uh, directly from one contact to the other. They go somewhat above and then come down and maybe uh, make contact with the source and you know, the two contacts you have. So when you reduce the width or shrink the width, and that's by etching, you not only remove the paths that are entirely in this region, but you also remove some of the paths or partial part of the so part of the path that are almost outside of this region. Therefore, you see an increase in the resistivity. Uh, there are also two other differences when you compare the effect of thickness and the effect of width. One of them is that light thickness width reduction causes the film to approach the threshold uh, by decreasing the density. However, the thickness decreases density at a faster rate compared to the width effect because, of course, you are removing layers of film and that. Uh, by that, you are basically approaching the threshold faster. And the other difference is that the length scales that these things show up is very different. For thickness, we had to go down below like 50 nanometer thickness to just see this increase in resistivity. For the width, it's uh, like one order, two order of magnitude above that we go when we go below like sorry, two micron or so, we see that effect before that happen. So it's, it's very different the uh, scales of like thickness and thickness. And then the reason for that is partially because the, these things are, when we deposit them, they are, like the nanotubes are lying mm -hmm. parallel to the substrate. So they, what, uh, what you see is that they are sort of uh, horizontally aligned. So that makes a difference. It's not completely random in three dimensions. So uh, the other thing we studied was that we said, okay, let's now decrease the temperature. and uh, reduce the temperature free from 300K to like 4K or even lower than that in some cases, 1.2 cases, this is one of those cases. Um, and what we notice is that, uh, first of all, this dependence is uh, showing a strong increase in resistivity. Uh, it's actually falling in, in the regime, which is called like between peak localization and strong localization. It's not very strong, uh, but it's, it's quite not metallic behavior also that you expect something like staying at the same level. So we could explain this data by a variable range popping theory and fluctuation induced tunneling at different ranges of temperature. 
At lower temperature, it's basically a dominant with by variable range coupling, following an equation like this, for example. And here, the exponent p can be extracted from something called active reduced activation energy, defined by this equation, and plotted here in this instant. From the slope of this dependence, we can extract that value of uh, basically p, which is a representative of the dimensionality of the transport in the field. And uh, the value we got is 0.29. For a three dimensional material, you expect something about 0.25. And this is pretty close to that. So uh, we ended up thinking that okay, it's almost three dimensional if the field thickness is quite high. Uh, the other important parameter is this T0. Uh, a value extracted by fitting this curve is about 40 degrees. And that's the temperature, uh, the highest temperature that this variable range coping is responsible. So basically, below that temperature, uh, the variable range coping can be responsible. Above that, of course, this reach with fluctuation in use time for the transport. Um, I need to also mention that the, this behavior is shown to depend on many different parameters. The, the length of the nanotubes, the basically bonding in these fields, and also the level of doping that's very important. If you dope these things high enough, you get sort of like mental behavior in this region. So now I switch to uh, talk just uh, like I guess one or two slides about the noise also, uh, which is also quite an important parameter uh, for applications such as sensors. Not only the absolute resistivity in the material is important, but how uh, you read the noise of these materials becomes very, very important. Uh, it should be significantly lower than the signal uh, basically rate that you get out of a certain amount of material that you introduce into the system. Uh, low frequency noise sometimes depicts a 1 over F type behavior, uh, which is basically when you plot uh, a current spectral density as a function of frequency, uh, you get, get sort of this 1 over F type uh, behavior for the dependence. And it can be shown uh, by this equation, the vertical equation, where this SI is the current spectral density, uh, I is the current, of course, A is the noise amplitude, F is the frequency. Uh, and uh, source of this noise, especially for nanotubes, is related mostly to uh, either carrier number fluctuations or mobility fluctuations. And if it's correct, related to carrier number fluctuations, we can further uh, basically expand this equation, uh, explaining A by the Boolean parameter divided by the number of carriers. Uh, I will explain why this is important, but before that, I need to mention that in this noise amplitude that's extracted for both individual tubes and films of nanotubes is reported to be extremely high, about 10 to minus 11. Compare that to like 10 to minus 17 to 10 to minus 19 that's reported for very good methods. It's a very high value. So it's, it's significant for some applications like high frequency or sensor. And uh, the other point is that, okay, if it is just carrier number fluctuation dependent, what you expect is that, okay, this noise amplitude should scale with 1 over n meaning that if you increase the dimensions of the device, like the length, the width, or the thickness of the device, you expect the noise level to decrease uh, linearly with those dimensions. That's interesting because if, if you follow that, you will notice that, for example, if you change the length of the device, and you plot something like A over R versus 1 over L squared, you expect uh, some, some dependence like, uh, like a linear dependence in that case, if you just plot like A over R versus L, it should be it should give you a power dependence of minus two. But uh, people have seen something a little bit different. For example, this is some experiments that have been done in 2004. People have seen that this exponent is closer to minus 1.3 instead of minus two. And also, the, this uh, basically can you, people have followed it up with other dimensions like the effect of thickness, the number of layers, same thing. And people have seen a significant decrease in the uh, in the noise amplitude that seems to not only scale with the thickness, but also scale with the resistivity level in this material. So basically, you now have a material that the thickness, the, you're changing one parameter like the thickness, but there is, a, there is an effect due to that thickness, and there is also an effect from the change in resistivity of that material. So I will come back to this when, when we go further. I will try uh, to explain how, how we try to model these effects into our computational uh, modeling approach. Uh, so in this part, I can just conclude that we successfully patterned CMT films down to submicro dimensions. Uh, the resistivity of narrow and thick films was two orders of magnitude higher than that of wide and thick films. 
the film also uh, basically show insulating behavior at very low temperatures. Resistivity and scaling dimensions is a signature of percolation threshold in these things. However, critical exponents are different for different nanotube and device parameters, such as fitness versus speed. So, okay, so in this section, I'm going to okay, explain what we got in terms of results, and now we try to explain those results a little bit better, trying to model them. And that modeling approach would include the resistivity scaling and also the noise scaling. I will talk a little bit about the correlation of noise with resistivity and dimensions, as I mentioned before, and also the significance of the junction noise in this case. So in order to model the things, we took a very, very simple approach at the beginning. Our approach was, okay, we generated some nanotubes randomly into some area, and randomly meaning that we had both a degree of freedom for the direction as well, of, uh, as, well as a degree of freedom for the uh, location of the, the basic area. Um, and then there, are, there were two contributors to the resistivity of the whole thing that we trying to calculate them. One was the resistance of the uh, junctions between tubes, like this sort of resistance or the bonds of the tubes. And the other one is the resistance of the tube itself. So if you look at it, you see that basically for the tubes, uh, we use the simple model based on the uh, mean free path and the contact resistance. Uh, so it's, it depends, like for its proportion of the length of the tube, if the length is large compared to the mean free path, it's quite large, otherwise it becomes negligible. For the junctions, uh, it depends on what sort of nanotubes are in contact with each other. Like if you have two semiconducting nanotubes, two metallic tubes, or a metallic and semiconductor tube, it gives you different values. And uh, it's interesting that basically it's not only that, but this junction resistance also depends on a series of other parameters, like what is the degree of alignment between two nanotubes, how much they are doped, what sort of surfactant we use when we were trying to deposit these things, and a lot of other parameters. So, but simply we just uh, determined it based on the type of the junction that you have. So, this is one result, for example, we got. We tried to fit uh, our experimental data that I showed you before in terms of width. Uh, basically the effect of wheat on resistivity and this black curve is what we were able to fit to the experimental data it's pretty nice fit all of the experimental data of course is scattered to some uh, and this is like an example of the network that's generated um, so this, we also saw this uh, kind of inverse power load dependence so then we said okay let's study some of the parameters that we were not as, uh, able to study experimentally and one of them was, for example, the effect of uh, length of the nanotube in the uh, network, because initially what we assumed was certain length for all of the nanotubes in the network. And uh, we studied, we basically swept the bit and uh, studied the, uh, that effect facing on resistivity for different bits. There are some interesting points here, like uh, the resistivity, first of all, increases in all of the cases. But for example, the point that the resistivity starts to increase changes as you change the the length of the device. Basically, for longer lengths, as you shrink the width, you start to cut up these net, uh, paths faster. So you, at higher widths, you still uh, get this uh, sort of start to increase in the resistivity. Also, the eventual critical exponent here is different. When you have like longer tubes, you get higher critical exponent because you are removing paths faster and faster. Um, so uh, these are some of the interesting things, and of course. If you plot, just keep the width constant and just plot the resistivity as a function of length, as I will show you in the next slide, you will get a very strong relationship, again, sort of a lot of power load dependence, the very strong power, which is 5.6. Uh, we did the same thing for the density. We got sort of same result. You can see that for different densities, the curves are a little bit different. And then we plotted again the resistivity as a function of density, and we went to, again, model this uh, parameter like this. But as I said, these exponents, in this case 2.3, is not something fixed and it depends on other parameters. To show that better, for example, if you if you plot like the resistivity as a function of nanotube length, and you change the relationship between the nanotube length and the density of the nanotube, you see completely different behaviors. And you almost can see that when the, nan when the density is fixed and you change the tube length, you get a very strong dependence. But if you change the length and the density based on the uh, basically a square of the length, one over a square of the length, you see almost a constant resistivity. So then you can put these two parameters in one equation and show something like this, where basically these exponents are the ones that they expect. And you see that the effect of length is almost uh, twice in terms of power stronger than the effect of density. 
So it's a very complicated system. That's what I'm trying to say. That every parameter depends on the values of other parameters, how you prepare the field, and uh, so it's it's not easy to just say okay, this exponent is like universal. You can use it. It's not like that. So the other interesting thing that we studied was that in experiments, of course, when we grow these materials, when we deposit this, field, there is always a distribution in the land of the nanotube. It's not just one piece left. And uh, it depends on also how you prepare it. You can see like two different distributions here. One is very wide, when you just uh, basically do these tubes. And if you sonicate them, you can make them like a smaller and a sharper distribution, but there is still a distribution. So what we did was basically we went on and tried to uh, simulate these fields with different distributions of the tube. In one case, of course, the distribution was zero, so there was no standard deviation. All the nanotubes had the same length. But then we change the distribution, and so like as we change it, the resistivity starts to change it here. You can see that this is one trend as a function of average length. The other one is a different trend. And then we notice that if you plot this resistivity as a function of RMS value of length instead of the average length, all of these data points fall on top of each other, which is quite interesting. And the reason we found out that this second power of length is important was that basically because when you change the length of the nanotube, each nanotube like sweeps an area like this center around this nanotube that you see. And so it's sort of related to the second power of uh, the area of that center depends on the second power of the tube. So it's important that you know what parameter is the important parameter for a scaling. In this case, it was the, the length to the power of two. So I will also explain a little bit about our noise results. Uh, what we just added to the network was exactly the same as before. The only thing was that we have to so somehow model the one over F noise in these tubes and the junctions between them. And we can write the whole equation for the equivalent, equivalent power of noise in this form, uh, which depends on the power of noise in individual elements, the resistance of the elements, and the current of the elements. And those resistance and current values, of course, can be obtained from like, the DC uh, uh, simulation as we did before. For these uh, basically amplitudes, there are two amplitudes. One is for the individual cubes, which is something in this format. And that is based on other experiments on basically very long semiconducting cubes that people have done. And for the junctions, though, the problem is that as far as I'm aware or you're aware of, there was no experiments done. So, but there were experiments that uh, modeled the junction between tubes and a uh, 3D metal, like a metal contact. And based on that, they, they saw that the relationship is like with the noise amplitude depends on the resistance of the junction. And so we used that in our approach. So we just basically calculated the resistivity of the network first, and then we modeled the noise based on these two assumptions. So the results, we got was pretty good in terms of alignment with the experiments. For example, this, this black dots are the data points that I showed you before. And you can see now that we have added all these open circles as our data. You can see that there's a pretty good fit in terms of um, the trend with the experimental noise values. And the exponent that we got also get from the simulations is pretty close to 1.3. And this difference between 1.3 and 2, again, <coughs> because this is a percolative transport and percolative noise behavior. It's not like something regular that you expect like minus two. So that's why the experiment becomes so big, so unnatural. Um, interesting thing is that the, as parameters affect the, uh, the, res the, the resistivity, they affect the noise. And for example, here we simulated two net different things with two different thicknesses. One was like three layers of network, the other one eight layers. And for eight layers, we also added our experimental data, which is for a feature field. And you see that, for example, uh, this previous case is for an inner film, inner network, and this is for a thicker film. And as you increase the thickness of the film, you get away from that percolation behavior. You get a uniform material. This exponent gets minus 1.9, which is very close to minus 2, so that we expect. Um, interesting thing is that, okay, so now if you go to other parameters like the width, you see, if you sweep the width and measure the amplitude of the noise, you get two completely different regions. One region is where, as we expected, the system again is out of the percolative region. Uh, it's just acting like uniformly. So the noise, uh, the amplitude is escaped with one over width, as we expect. 
The other region is again that the resistivity starts to increase and the resistivity has an effect on the noise. And to separate these two things from each other, we can just simply multiply the noise amplitude by W to, effect, to remove the effect of W and then just look at it as a function of resistivity. And we see a very nice, a nice fitting like to, the, uh, to the data that we get. And as a matter of fact, we also tried this with our uh, four-part probe structures. Uh, we measured them as a function of heat, uh, and then we just normalized it like I explained here. And we got sort of like similar trend in terms of the behavior. So the exponents were a little bit different, I guess, because our systems were a little bit different. It was not that simple. Um, but anyway, pretty good argument, pretty good explanation of the data. Um, so one last important point is that how important are the junctions in this field in terms of introducing noise? And just let me mention that this is some experimental data that other people observe the uh, effect of thickness on the noise. And uh, basically, we have plotted our effect of thickness on the noise as well here. Then the junction noise was included as like in previous slides. And you, you can see that the trends, again, are sort of matching. However, if you remove the noise from the junctions, you make them absolutely zero, what you get is a completely reverse sort of behavior compared to this one. It shows that basically the junction noise is very, very important in this case and needs to become included. However, the source of that is not very uh, well known so far. So more experiments are needed to be done on individual junctions between the tubes to determine the noise. So just to conclude this section also, the Monte Carlo simulations explain the experimental results and really the geometrical nature of resistivity scaling. As expected, monitoring and device parameters have very significant effects on both the absolute value of resistivity and speed field scaling. The RMS tube length was the uh, important parameter explaining the effect of length on resistivity. And the noise amplitude also depends on both device dimensions and thin resistivity, and the two junctions are very important. So the last part of my talk, uh, I'm just going to discuss uh, the results of our characterization of mental sentiment and mental junctions. It's more like an applied uh, sort of uh, study, so I hope that you will enjoy that more. Um, I will talk about how we fabricate these, I'm sorry, the state MSN junctions and the analyze the transport through them and then the photo response of the devices. So what are MSN photo detectors? These photo detectors are basically then you have a metal in one contact with the same conductor and then another metal, and you form them in a sort of interdigitated finger structure. So between two of these fingers, there's a metal that's in contact with the same conductor and another metal. So the current path is through the basically same conductor between these two metal contacts. And then you shine light on top of this structure, and then you get a response from uh, the substrate, uh, basically the current. So you, you can measure the top light and mid light and see how much enhancement the current is. So what are the advantages of these metal semiconductor metal structures? Uh, for one, they are uh, basically uh, simply can be fabricated. The uh, cost of the fabrication is not that high. Uh, there is an opportunity for monolithic integration of these devices with other devices because simply the substrate is a regular semiconductor. And if you, if you can incorporate the fabrication approach for whatever material you're using for metal, then you can of course uh, integrate them with other devices like amplifiers that you need for this kind of uh, response. And then they show potentially low capacitors. So how we fabricate them? Uh, we start from a silicon substrate. We simply put a dielectric silicon dioxide or we initially get that like all already thermally grown. And then we etch using wet etching the oxide open some windows here. Then we basically deposit these CNT tubes over all the structure, and then we start patterning them into this interdigitated figure structure. And then we eventually deposit some uh, metals on top uh, using like beaming uh, evaporation. Uh, the final structure we do something like this. Here uh, you can see that the, these are like uh, one contact, this is the other contact, and all of these fingers are connected here. And all of these fingers in this case was the CNT thing basically material. So this window here is the window that the oxide is etched. The rest of the area is covered with oxide. So this is the active area of the device. And basically, you get currents between, for example, these two fingers, these two fingers, and these currents are what uh, makes the device work. Uh, here is an uh, atom force microscopy image of a zooming in this region between two fingers. You can see the, the structure of the field and the 
region that sits the south. So important parameters here like is uh, the figure length and figure, uh, or the area of it of it was. And then there is like uh, figure spacing here that's also important. And uh, basically you can change this to study what happens with the response of the things. So we initially just measured the uh, ID characteristics and CV characteristics of these devices. Here you can see the ID response. Um, it looks very symmetric, you expect that the device's the structure is very symmetric. Uh, however, you see like uh, you sort of expect it to kind of saturate it in terms of current. So the current should saturate like this and saturate like this. And shows this rectified behavior also. Uh, but this saturation doesn't happen, and I think the one reason for that uh, can be basically uh, due to shunty barrier lowering due to charge accumulation at surface states and the strong electric field that you have at the edges of these windows. Um, also, CV uh, characteristics uh, show the, again, the symmetric structure of these fields, and it's also pretty much matching with what you expect out of these devices. So then, what we said, we said, okay, we can analyze these new junctures a little bit more carefully, we decrease the temperature a little bit. And we first studied the, in a limited range of temperature between 250 and like 340 Kelvin. And uh, we just measured ID characteristics as a function of voltage. And you see that the ID looks a little bit uh, different. The level of, of course, current changes because the saturation level changes with the you know, temperature. And uh, if you just ex use like some simple shutting the theory based on thermionic emission, uh, with two different barriers for electrons and for holes, you get an equation simply like this. And if you rearrange this uh, equation, you can plot basically the current over T squared as a function of 1 over T uh, to extract something like the barrier heights for electrons and holes. And this is called the Richardson plot, and it's plotted here. And what, what it gives you is that it gives you some data points that you can have a slope by fitting a line to them. And then from that slope, you can extract the barrier parts. And I shall mention, I haven't shown you here, but uh, these devices show uh, either electrodes or poles are the dominant carrier for transport. That's why you can just do this simply and just based on what carrier is important, you can extract the barrier for one day. So basically, one of these two terms is always dominant, so you can just, uh, you just uh, change the equation and plot it like this for that part. Um, so shunty barrier heights that we export, uh, basically, or obtain were different for N-type substrates and P-type substrates. However, they were not that much different. For example, for, uh, I think, uh, N-type, if, if I'm right, uh, we got uh, 0.45, 0.46 electron volts. For P-type, it was a little bit higher, 0 0.50, 0 0.52 electron volts. And then if you add them up together, with a little bit of shunty barrier lowering that happens at zero bias, uh, due to basically natural slurring, then you get sort of the band gap of the silicon, the 1.12 electron of that experiment. Um, so then we increase the range of temperature intensity led down to a liquid nitrogen range, like 77 Kelvin. And what we saw was that uh, there was a significant decrease in current, of course, as we expected, but also there was a sort of a saturation in current that we related mostly to the tunneling or the Franklin cool effect that uh, is uh, basically dominant in that temperature region. And that basically is uh, the, the barriers are getting so high that, uh, I mean, we just need to tunnel through them and cannot have like a significant thermodynamic tension because you don't have enough energy for that. So the final uh, thing that we studied, of course, the intended the study of this device was the effect of the uh, photo current and the dark current and the comparison between them. In order to do that, we fabricated some controller structures in which basically we replace these CNT pins uh, with uh, titanium gold dot bilayer metals. And uh, it was like a simple like metal semiconductor metal structure, a regular one. And then what we noticed was that, okay, in terms of uh, the dark current, we noticed that the dark current of the CNT pin through this black curve was somewhat lower than the dark current of the metal control. Uh, this could be due to two reasons. One is that we don't have absolute control over the barrier height for the metal or the CNP in case. So it could be due to the lower or the lower barrier height for the uh, metal control. It also could be due to uh, the fact that these nanotubes are porous. So not basically all of the nanotubes are making uh, contact with the, or basically cover the whole area that is like the active area of the device. So the actual area 
that you get between nanotubes and the substrate is significantly lower than the area that you designed the, for the device. So that, is, that could be the second reason. And later studies also confirm that that's to some extent important. Um, so basically, just based on uh, what we got for the photo at dark time, the responsivity of the device defined as like the photo kind as a, over like the input power is about 0 0.133 ampere per watt at 5 volt for these devices. And then uh, for the for there's another parameter I should define it here the uh, NPDR or the normalized photo to dark current ratio, which is just the responsibility divided by dark current, so the photo current over dark current over the input power. And that value is about 1.7124 uh, per millibot for at 5 volts like for the CNTK devices. Uh, I should mention that the photo response of the devices for the metal controls is initially better, especially at low bias. But as you can see, there is a huge increase in the photo response of the CATP, which makes the device eventually at 5 volt better. Of course, 5 volt is not the optimized uh, optimized uh, voltage for these kind of devices. It's less than it's usually around 1 volt, 2 volt. Uh, at that range of voltage is more like their uh, response is comparable, but at higher voltages, the, the feeling becomes better. And I guess partially that's because the then you, you inject so many carriers in the semiconductor, uh, and they sort of pile up at the edge of the nanotubes, and these nanotubes are so small, you get such a field enhancement that you effectively lower the barrier so much that the current can increase like over orders of magnitude like you see here in the photo. So in order to conclude, this section also the CNT team forms a shuttle contact on both n-type and p-type signal substrates. Average shuttle barrier heights of 0 0.51 and 0 0.45 were extracted for n-type and p-type silicon. Also, we did this uh, analysis for gallium arsenide devices and we extracted 0 0.46 electron volt barrier for uh, just uh, sort of under gallium arsenide uh, structure uh, or substrates. The current transport is due to thermionic emission at, uh, of electrons at temperatures above like 240 K and due to tunneling at lower temperatures. And also the CMD film on SM device exceeds a significantly lower dark current when compared to the metal control while maintaining a comparable or close value of photo current and high bias. So thank you very much. Detectors are uh, very valuable for high speed applications. Um, and you've looked at resistivity and uh, you looked at responsivity. Have you looked at any modulation characteristics? No, no. no. So I'm really concerned as you uh, make very thin uh, structures that, that the uh, responsivity may be uh, somewhat uh, uh, affected negatively from the uh, high resistance. Uh, well, um, well, actually, we, for this purpose, I think the thin frequencies that we used were usually in the range of 50 to 100 nanometer, so they were not really that thin in that case. So the resistivity width, oh, no, the width of these, uh, I guess the minimum width that we had was uh, 2 micron, and I think people usually go down to around maybe uh, 1 micron, half a micron in most of the cases when they uh, do fabricate these things, uh, and up to that range, so that you have a good control of the device, the resistivity is not that bad. It might be actually somewhat two or three times low, higher, but not that bad. If you really push it to the nanometer region, like 200, 100 nanometer, that's the point that you get a very, very high resistance. And actually, in our crisis, anyway, we didn't have anything below two micro, so we didn't see any sort of the transparency of the thing will give us a little bit advantage over like, some, like many metals that might be used because they are just not transparent if you deposit a like 50 nanometer of metal. 
But eventually it turned out that there are so many other things in effect, like that porosity effect that I mentioned, and like the increase in the photocard so strong in the field that we applied, that was completely out of what we expected. So uh, because of that, I guess we didn't, we didn't that continue this study to like study the effect of it. And also one, one other thing is that the porosity of the pin, uh, if you mean like the, how much, how many nanotubes are in contact with the substance, that we cannot improve much by yeah. changing right by changing. level for the noise, the thermal noise of this material, which is just depends on the resistance and it's just with the fluctuation of the carriers that we generally have in any, even if you choose a single resistor, I measure that that shows. And that only depends on the resistance and it's always there as a flat, I mean it's a large <coughs> noise. Mm -hmm. So eventually that one of our things goes below that so you just see that. So you are seeing that, you actually were seeing that. Right, right. right. Sure. Do you do this in multiple temperatures to see if there's a, um, if that noise flow moves? Well, Yes, actually, true. That moves. Uh, we, we have done a, I mean, I didn't show this here, but we have done a temperature dependent noise study, and yeah, that, that moves. Not only that moves, but also the one over the level noise of the change. It changes. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Thank you.
advice. He's a customer. 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 He's a customer.